Hey guys, Darkovica here, and uh, welcome back to Vampire, Coteries of New York. Uh, please do not mind my gigantic oversized sweater. It is basically pure happiness. It's a Sherpa type thing. It's pure happiness. Anyways, so I am returning to Vampire, the Masquerade Coteries of New York. Obviously, uh, the last episode was a little messed up in that I uploaded them out of order. For those of you watching in the future, you'll have no idea what I mean, and that's okay. For those of you who are watching in December of 2019, you know what happened. <laughs> so let's go ahead and pop in and pretend nothing happened. We're returning to Marie on night two of her time as a vampire. Literally just turned into a vampire. We've got, you know, sunlight blocking shades in our brand new fancy apartment. Uh, absolutely no family. Just my employer. You open your eyes. The bed isn't warm. The room is filled with artificial light from the ceiling. The solid metal door is closed. Normally you'd stretch for a bit. On some mornings you'd probably throw the quilt over yourself and snooze a moment longer. <laughs> That's me every morning. But that was before. The way you woke up now, you are fully conscious. No grogginess, nothing weighing you down. Just the nagging need in the back of your head. Hunger. Not as severe as the last time, but unmistakably there. You get up and open the door to the main room. A digital clock on the TV shows you the time. 9.04 p.m. You walk over to the blinds and retract them cautiously. The only light coming in is NYC's artificial nighttime luminescence. So that's what your waking hours are going to look like now. You miss the sunlight already. You're seriously considering just walking out of the apartment and figuring this all out by yourself, but then you come back to the memory of Shadir's exotic sword being raised in the gallery. I feel like that's something- like, I was about to be all like, I wouldn't miss it. I, you know, I'd love the lights at night, but that's coming from someone who can go back and forth, obviously. If I had the sunlight suddenly ripped me from me, I'd definitely be like, and eh, now I want sunlight. That's all I want. I can't have it, now I want it. So I get that. Maybe sticking around isn't that bad of an idea after all. You keep jumping channels for around half an hour and then switch to streaming services. Disney Plus! Almost as if the universe had a sense of irony, you catch true blood in the flood of recommendations. The doorbell rings. Oh, thank God. It's Sophie. Ah, uh, but what did I go with? Good evening, Marie. Sleep well? Like a dead man. <laughs> like a dead man. Curious wording, but not far from the truth, I suppose. I'm going to change up her accent a little bit, partially because I can't remember it, and also partially because I decided I didn't like super posh British accent for her. Curious wording, but not far from the truth, I suppose. No use dwelling on it. I think you will agree with time. You made the right choice yesterday. I can teach you many things about yourself, your blood, its desires, and its powers. We will begin tonight. You are hungry, yes? I'm sure you are. Our kind always is. There is only one remedy. The blood. The drinks we had yesterday at Elysium are not the usual way you slake your thirst. So tonight, she kind of sounds like a robot now, I, so tonight I will assist you in the first foyer into hunting. You need to learn to sense the kind of blood you desire, to understand how you can use the kind's vulnerabilities to your advantage. I'm ready to learn. Predator and prey, huh? Grim. Alright, uh, I'm gonna be eager to learn. Let's learn. Well, I'm ready to learn. Let's get started. I'm gonna give her a higher-pitched, innocent voice, even though I don't really think that's quite accurate for her. Such eagerness. Or is it your hunger making you impatient? You will find that drinking moderate amounts of it regularly will keep the hunger and the whispers of the beast away. You might think yourself monstrous, but there is a balance to be found here. The kiss gives the kind pleasure. You might remember this from your own embrace. Some can even become addicted to the sensation, but if you do it right, they tend to misremember your feeding. Okay, I think we can, uh, we can guess what the kiss is. But, uh, the kiss is the act of drinking blood, usually from a mortal. The kiss causes feelings of ecstasy in those who receive, receive it. Yeah, it sounds like a predator type thing to do. Kind of like a spider, actually. Actually, I don't think spiders do that at all. There's something that does that, I swear. The act of transforming a mortal into a vampire. The embrace requires the vampire to drain her victim and then replace that victim's blood with a bit of her own. I'm glad I just happened to know all of this. After all, 
Vampires do not exist. They are myths, fairy tales, and pop culture mainstays, correct? I forgot to explain this. We smashed our goals on the last three episodes. Uh, obviously, I have a continuing um, sort of threshold for my videos for each series, which was suggested by God Kingar. Um, and that is that if a, it, if a video series gets within one or two weeks of its upload over 30 views, which I think is a fair amount for my channel, um, I can assume that it's a, it's a healthy series. It's getting a lot of attention and I, that kind of keeps me invigorated to upload it. It's also a sign that it's not like a waste of time or a waste of energy because I do like to entertain, like for me, the more views I have, the more I feel like I'm entertaining everyone versus just a small portion. So I get sort of antsy when I don't have a whole lot of views. I know that, you know, five views is still five people, but uh, when that tends to happen, I sort of lose energy. Anyways, let's continue. 30 views. That's it. I, I don't care about likes. That's, I feel like likes is a bit much to ask for. I don't really do anything. Views! Views do things. I mean, likes do things too. If you want to give me a like, I would, I would like that, but you know, views! <laughs> All right. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. She gives you a sly, oh, she gives you a sly knowing smile. That is why the masquerade is so important and even more crucial when you feed. How do you avoid being seen? How do you cover your tracks? How do you select a victim? How do you cover your tracks? Biting people leaves marks, right? And the victims remember your face. You shouldn't concern yourself with leaving marks. These are easy to conceal. You just need to bite carefully and then lick the punctures closed. That's all there is to it. Oh, yes, of course. That's all there is to it. As for being remembered, like I mentioned, the kiss is an ecstatic experience, so kind can barely recall the details. And even when they do, this city is enormous. You could spend days on the streets and not see the same face twice. Use that to your advantage. Feeding from the same area repeatedly can be dangerous, but by branching out, you risk the ire of other kindred on whose domains you trespass. Lucky for you, New York City is more forgiving in this regard. The Camarilla term for vampires as a whole. Or a single vampire. According to rumor, this term came about in the 15th or 16th century after the Anarch Revolt. I think that's actually a reference to the first Vampire the Masquerade game, which is one of my favorite games. It's just very, very, very hard. <laughs> Uh, domain. The area of a particular vampire's influence. Princes claim entire cities as their domain, sometimes allowing lesser vampires to claim domain within. Oh boy, aristocracy. New York is in somewhat of a unique position. Many of its neighborhoods remained contested or unclaimed. The reason for this is a lesson for another time, but keep the following in mind. Take opportunities to feed when they present themselves these upcoming nights. As long as you hunt cautiously and respect the masquerade at all times, you should be fine. To wit, I want you to join me for a trip tonight. Come downstairs. Gregory is waiting for us. The busy street fills the air with traffic noises, pedestrian chatter, and a mix of smells that disorient you momentarily. These warm bodies contain what you want, what you need. You catch yourself. Did you really just think of these people as mere sources of blood? It takes a nudge from Sophie to break your train of thought. Her driver opens the door for her and then tips his hat to you, gesturing to the back of the car. The car casually joins the somewhat thinned New York traffic. It's still busy. I beg your pardon, what was that? Uh, anyways. It's still busy in a way one of the biggest cities in the world can be, but compared to the daytime commute, it's a pleasant drive. You barely have time to gather your thoughts and questions before the car comes to a stop. You're among the tall skyscrapers that make up Manhattan's iconic skyline. Come, Marie. Park the car, Gregory, will you? The driver just nods and Sophie gets out. You join her, and the two of you walk through the glass doors together, then take the elevator up. You first notice an empty stage with the instruments of a string quartet still in the back, then taking a few dozen chairs in front of it. The concert seem, seeming concluded, the patrons, all smartly dressed and posh, have spread out all over the hall. Sophie strides confidently inside, produces an invitation from her purse that she flashes in front of a security guard. You follow close and are let through without issue. Let's start easy. A social setting like this one would usually prove quite challenging to an inexperienced kindred, but consider this evening a small gift from your patron. I'm hoping to procure for you a willing vessel. Just remember what I told you about taking small sips. This one I have a soft spot for. Don't damage her. Oh dear god, I'm scared now. Now let's see here. Ah, 
There he is. She notices. I thought she said her. I'm confused. Don't damage her. And then, ah, there he is. Okay. I'm not crazy. She notices someone in the crowd, flashes a heart-melting smile, and suddenly even you feel drawn to her. You haven't thought about it before, but it's laid clear before you in this moment. Sophie is beautiful. Just looking at her is a privilege. Just being with her makes you feel elated. We getting drawn in by some vampire powers. Everybody in the crowd, but especially the man who's almost tripping over himself to reach her, clearly agrees. Edgar, I'm so happy to see you. Oh, okay, I see, I understand. How is your daughter? Is she with you? Oh, there she is. Julie, my girl, come over, please. There is somebody I'd like you to meet. The young woman who walks across the hall can't be more than 19 years old. It's clear from her mismatched earrings and the partially faded purple hair dye that she doesn't fit this crowd. Julie, this is Marie. I think the two of you should get acquainted while I talk business with your dad. Awfully boring stuff, I assure you. I'm positive you'll like each other. The girl gives you a shy smile and nods toward the balcony stairs. You follow, somewhat unsure what it is exactly Sophie expects you to do. You reach a secluded space from which the entire lobby is visible. All eyes are on Sophie. They listen intently, then laugh when she does. Julie saves you the trouble of figuring out the next step. If you're with Sophie, then I guess you're, um, I mean, that you, you know. She puts her wrist to her lips and gives herself a theatrical nip, then looks to you, embarrassed, but also hopeful. What, you're into that sort of thing? I'm not gonna put her on the spot, yo. Yeah, I do. Yes, yes, I do. She takes off her jacket, unbuttons her sleeve, then rolls it up. You see a tattoo of a cat and an astronaut suit, one feline eye winking at you. There, just enjoy. All right, a perfectly awkward smile and a blush. Well, best do what we best do, drink from Julie. You take her forearm in your hands. A quick look around confirm nobody's watching, and no security cameras cover this area. You bite down, gently. It's surreal. She's just giving you her blood of her own volition. How is this possible? What about the masquerade? You need to ask Sophie. You tear away from her. A brief convulsion shakes you. Her smell. It's her smell. It's not right. The temporary feeling of bliss the girl felt when you bit her is gone in an instant. She's disappointed. Annoyed, even. She looks at you, unsure of what's the matter. Come back, please, just have some more. Just a little bit more. Oh god, she's addicted. The very thought makes you want to throw up what little of her blood you've tasted. You shake your head. The girl sniffs, starts crying, wipes her jacket into her wipes her face into her jacket sleeve, and walks down the stairs and into the hall. The crowd around Sophie disperses slowly. Looking at her now, only some residual awe hangs in the air. Yes, she's pretty, maybe even beautiful, sure, but not your type. What came over you before? vampire powers. You walk over to her. Edgar, dear, it was splendid talking to you, but we need to get going. Give Julie my best wishes. Come with, Marie. Gregory is waiting for you out front. It's only in the car that Sophie addresses you. So, how did it go? She was tasty. We're not lying. You people are sick. I tried, but... I tried, but I couldn't do it. I couldn't stand the smell or the taste. Curious. I consider Julie's blood to have one of the most exquisite and unique bouquets in the city. And trust me, I have refined taste. She almost sounds like she's offended. Oh well, if at first you don't succeed, perhaps you need a change of pace. Time for the next stop. Training wheels off this time. Gregory, Flushing Meadows, please. The driver takes the car over to the Williamsburg Bridge. You settle your thoughts. What did you do to the people back there? Those people back at- Those people back at the hall. They were all entranced. Even I was under your spell. What was that? She smiles with satisfaction. That old trick. Just the blood doing my bidding. We all have our talents. Some of them come from the legacy we inherit from our sire. Others can be learned with experience. I can sway people or make them fear me. I see more of the world in greater detail than some kindred. I can will my body- I'm sorry, I'm doing this and I'm sure that's not fun to look at. I can will my body to move with unparalleled precision and grace. And more. All of these skills make me who I am. They also help me hunt. What are my powers? Okay, so what are my talents? Time will tell. You need to discover them yourself. When we arrive, experiment. Give different things a try. Follow your instinct and intuition. 
it will guide the blood. Always keep the masquerade in mind, however. It is all fine if you can disappear in plain sight, or command animals with your mind, but save those overt talents for the right place and time. It only takes you half an hour to reach the park at this time of night. Both you and Sophie leave the car, with Gregory left behind again to find a parking spot and keep an eye on the car. Sophie ke seems deep in thought. She takes in the surroundings with a dreamy gaze. The sky is surprisingly clear tonight, the stars just barely visible in the light-polluted aura of the city. I feel like having a snack myself. I'll be by the fountain. Go, look for somebody to your liking. See what effects you can achieve with your blood, but only pick one victim. Just one. Then come back. Seeing how she seems not altogether here right now, you decide to leave Sophie to her own devices and seek out your prey. From here, it looks like you have a few choices. Just taking a stroll around the park and finding an isolated jogger or someone like them could work, but focusing on one area might work better. The New York State Pavilion might work as a secluded spot. There's a skate park nearby, and worst case scenario, there's bound to be some unfortunate wino around. Or maybe the tennis court's nearby? There's light coming from there, so somebody might still be playing a late night match. They won't be alone, but they might be tired and let their guard down. As these scenarios play out in your mind, you realize you're planning how to assault a stranger in the middle of the night. It's a weird way to be, but the now familiar hunger prompts you to act. I think we should hunt near the decrepit pavilion. Because, oh god, why is this an, I mean, I understand why it's an option, but not feeding would be terrible. Um, I think the decrepit pavilion is a good idea, because if it's decrepit, that might mean there's no security. And if we walk around the park, there's a good chance that we are just going to run into groups of people. Let's try it. You make your way to one of the park's most well-known landmarks. Okay, maybe I was incorrect about this option. The round skeleton of the New York State Pavilion, with its two vaguely futuristic-looking towers. You don't get lucky with the skate park. It's not deserted. Instead, a group of skaters is gathered there, talking loudly and listening to music playing out of crackling smartphone speakers. Deciding to have a quick look around, you identify a potential victim. A sleeping bag lady, leaned back on a bench, a shopping cart full of what looks like trash nearby. Even thinking of that second option makes you feel sick. You decide to take your chances with the skaters, not even getting close to the homeless woman. You think back to what Sophie did in the hall, how she managed to focus the attention of the entire gathering on her. That might be a tall order for you, but a single person? Could be doable. You single out a guy who's talking on his phone away from the gathering. He's having a heated discussion with somebody. A relative? A partner? It's not going well. The talk's over. I said, okay, I remember the swearing in this. I said, shut the fuck up. Hey, you hearing me? Shut up. Call me when you get some fucking sense into your stupid brain, okay? That was violent. I felt weird. He ends the call abruptly and almost throws the phone to the ground in frustration. Rough night? Rough night? He's got an angry expression on his face and tears welling in his eyes, but he gives you a curious look and even a bit of a shy smile. Yeah, you could say that. What's up? I got just the cure for that downer. Oh, boy, is this where I strike out and learn a horrible, a valuable lesson about, let's talk. I want to show you something. I got just the, okay, I feel like we got to flirt, right? I got something that'll put a smile on your face. He takes a few steps forward away from his buddies, who remain totally oblivious to what's happening, but you see your influence fading. You take your chance and lunge. Your fangs sink into his exposed shoulder. He shivers and lets out a moan. His phone hits the pavement and you hear the casing crack. His blood tastes like a clash of hot emotion and melancholy, laced with some artificial stimulant you can't quite place. An energy drink? A recreational drug? It's a strange mix. You hardly have the chance to savor it, as the proximity of the skater's friends make you feel vulnerable. You hastily finish drinking and drag the guy over to the pavilion. When you turn around, you realize you're not alone. A hooded man is looking menacingly at you. What do you think you're doing, barging into my turf like this, lick? Oh, we got a vampire. Okay. Um, a derogatory term usually used to address young, unexperienced vampires. If you know I'm inexperienced, then why are you asking questions? Clearly, I don't know. Kind of didn't mean to trespass. I'm gone. D I didn't mean to trespass. Sorry, I'm going. Too late for that, friendo. You want to leave here in one piece? You talk, candidly. I know what you are, so you could shove that masquerade misdirection up your ass. Now better tell me who you're with before my posse shows up and we beat it out of you. 
I'm with the Camarilla. I'm here with Sophie Langley. I feel like we need to be specifically Sophie Langley. I came here with Sophie Langley. She's my patron. Doesn't ring a bell. Sounds fancy, though. He licks his lips, exposing his fangs and look at you, looking at you voraciously. A nervous tick or an attempt at intimidation? I wonder, what would you Callahan do if I brought you in, huh? Break your shins? What? What would Callahan do to you if I brought you in, huh? Break your shins? Leave you out to be kissed by the sun? Oh, concrete shoes, maybe. He's old school like that. Force him to back down. Let's try it. Enough's enough. You won't be intimidated by this asshole. Leave. Now. His countenance change. changes. A cruel beast one moment, a humbled pup the next. He walks away, just like that. How did you do it? Not wishing to tempt fate any further, you return to the unisphere, looking back over your shoulder to make sure you're not being followed. Two figures are visible near the sculpture, a man and a woman, tangled in a passionate embrace. No, not exactly. It's Sophie, feeding, but this whole scene is set up so that it looks like a couple getting intimate in public. She pulls it off like she's done it a hundred times before. It occurs to you that she probably has. The man is unsure on his feet as she lets go of him and leads him towards a nearby bench. Noticing you, she whispers something into his ear and leaves him. Her driver appears from behind a tree. Well, Marie, how did it go? You're about to answer when the same figure as before emerges from one of the alleys. He looks at the three of you, and a predatory smile creeps onto his lips. You're screwed, dumb fuck. You think you can mess with my head and get away with it? Think you'll be safe with your friends? Well, I have friends, too. He makes a motion to shout, but two things happen almost at the same time. First, that feeling of warmth and beauty emanating from Sophie flares up again, entrancing both you and the hooded thud. thug. His shout comes out as a weak, confused squeak. Second, Gregory produces a wooden stake from a holster under his jacket and slams it into the thug's chest. Just like that, in a few seconds, the posturing vampire is down on the ground, paralyzed. I see you've made a friend, Marie. Curious choice of company, I would say. Who is he? He mentioned a Callahan. He said something about presenting me to somebody named Callahan. Ever heard of him? I'm gonna just tell her everything, I think. She looks shocked for a split second, then recovers her regular countenance. Yes, I have. This hoodlum is Anarch, then? Curious. Corona Park has not been claimed by any kindred last I checked. The Anarch Movement, a vampire sect that opposes the tyranny of elders and has placed itself outside the secret society of the Camarilla. Yeah, there's like, there's technically four societies, I think, but Nosferatu are not a part of this. Mm, mm, I just forgot the word. Malkavian, there we go. I'm totally blanked on it. I think Malkavians are just a type of vampire, so insane, but not a whole society. Um, this hoodlum is Anarch, then. Okay. Let's go to the car. We'll put him in the trunk and present him to Shadir tomorrow night. I'm sure he'll be delighted to make this unbounds acquaintance. Gregory carries the staked vampire and dumps him in the car's trunk like a mannequin. It's a strange sight, and you're quite happy you're not in that poor fucker's shoes right now. It's almost surprising that you can get away with just casually throwing a stiff into your car and driving away. But then you remember that Sophie has been doing this far longer than you have. Still, the nagging thought that anything you did tonight could have been recorded on a CCTV camera or picked up by a rando with a half-decent smartphone and streamed online fills you with dread. Hunting and using your abilities is a dangerous business. It's clear that this whole being a vampire thing has about as many caveats as it has perks. And that's the point of World of Darkness. You're not as strong as you think you are. You're taken out of your headspace by Sophie's voice. I will pick you up tomorrow night, same as tonight. I have some business to attend to at Elysium, and I expect you to accompany me. Plus, our friend in the back needs to be properly introduced to Shadir and the Prince. I'm sure he'll have some interesting things to say to the court. The social system of the city's kindred, resembling the feudal system of mortals. Yeah, about right. At the top is the prince. Below them, the members of the Primag Primogen Council. Order in the domain is maintained by a sheriff. The gatherings are organized in secret sanctuaries known as Elysiums. Her voice is cold, cruel, and nothing like the enchanting personality she showed at the gallery earlier tonight. Sophie is clearly a woman of many faces. I do the same. I do the. Well, what's going to happen to him? Let's just ask that. What's going to happen to him? The usual, I imagine. Interrogation by Shadir. Probably in the basement of the gallery. A quick trial with the prince in attendance if she's there tomorrow night. A swift execution as the verdict. This all sounds eerily familiar to you, and you can't help but feel a pang of guilt when you think about what awaits this guy tomorrow night. I guess it was my fault. I used an ability. You haven't told me how your hunting went. Getting the hang of it, I would hope. 
Um, it'll take some, well, I think so, yeah. I think I am, yeah. I'll cope. I'm glad. She doesn't question you further. She seems distracted, not all there. Her thoughts drift and the car remains silent until you reach your apartment. God, every time I record, my nose is so itchy and I don't understand why. Literally nothing before this. I swear it's a nervous tick. Um, we will pick you up tomorrow evening. Good night. Just like that, without any further courtesy, Sophie leaves, driven to her apartment by Gregory with body in the trunk, right in the middle of Manhattan. Did you cross path paths with situations like these in the past, unknowingly? What other secrets did you pass on the streets without knowing their true nature? Your haven is just as you left it hours ago. Although the sun won't come up for some time, you feel tired. You learn something about yourself today, and it'll take some time to process. A vampire's home or base where they find sanctuary from the sun. I guess we could have assumed that. You're not in the mood for television, and the few books on, on the shelves of the apartment are either in languages you don't speak or sound like a boring read. Nothing left to do but rest. You settle in the back room, lock the door, a moment of hesitation, but then a decision. This time you turn the light off. You think back to Julie. How many people in this city know about this vampiric society? How many are willing accomplices in sustaining it? And the thug you met in the park. If he's not Camarilla, then what is he? Are there independent vampires? How does that work? More questions. You begin wondering if there's ever going to be a night when you can start crossing them off the list instead of adding to it. You close your eyes. You sink into the now familiar void of nothingness. It greets you with open arms like an old friend. All right. I think this is a good place to leave this episode. Thank you so much for watching, everybody. And I appreciate your your views and your enjoyment of the series hopefully this week i get the episodes in the correct order <laughs> i'll see you guys next time thank you so much for watching bye